Rory Sutherland. Welcome to the Development by David podcast. How are you today? Ah, oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, very good. To, uh, tired. I've just been driving back from the Kent coast all afternoon, but it wasn't too. It, it wasn't too bad a drive actually. Um, so uh, fairly happy. I'm really hoping this conversation is at least a little bit caffeinating, Rory. <laughs> Thanks. No, no, I, I might actually ask my wife for a cup of tea actually in in, in mid uh, mid podcast too, just to uh, 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 just to caffeinate up a bit more. But how are you? Where, where are you calling from, by the way? From the west coast of Scotland, from a town called Preswick. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's famous as the place where Elvis landed, isn't it? I was about to bring that to your attention, but did you know that every single restaurant and cafe and bar within the the restaurants named after him? Um, I find it quite fascinating, even though he didn't actually leave the plane. I think the plane refueled and took off again. I, I thought he left the plane to refuel and went into some sort of cafeteria. Um, the, you know part of the reason why he never actually came, which is actually a bit fascinating, uh, which is part, part of the reason he never came to the UK and went on a, on a kind of worldwide tour, uh, was I think Colonel Tom Parker was actually an illegal Dutch immigrant and so couldn't really leave the United States for fear that he wouldn't be able to get back in or was unable to get a passport or something. There's some really weird reason why Elvis, because I don't think he ever played outside the United States. Any, obviously in Germany, he was in the army, okay? And there are recordings of him playing the piano and so forth in the army in Germany. But I don't think he ever played a concert outside, obviously he played in Hawaii, but outside the, the 50 states, I'm fairly sure. And part of the reason for that's a, might be something of that kind, yeah. Funnily enough, I've got I've got vague relatives from up that way as well. It's it's um it's Lanarkshire, is it? Yes, that's about forty minutes more central. Uh, it's cl- close by Glasgow. Got it. Okay. Yeah, got it. That's they are uh, some some of my let me let me get this right. It would have been my father's father's mother's relatives, I think. Uh, family called Rorison, who are. Uh, uh, va- variously from Dumfriesshire and Lanarkshire. I don't, I don't quite know the connection, but that's as far as I can go. And remind me, where are you dialing in from? Just outside the M25. So I'm in Kent, uh, between Seven Oaks and Westrum. Uh, so it's, um, if you consider the sort of bottom right-hand corner of the M25, that's about where I am, plus a mile. Uh, so it's it's pretty rural out here, actually. That's the bizarre thing. I suppose it's a product of the green belt. But you don't have to go that far outside London before it actually becomes pretty rustic pretty fast. Um, that's partly why I moved here. Hmm. I've heard you write... Oh, sorry, I read about your home. I'm not sure if you're in the same home that you've wrote about, but you speak about how you essentially bought art when you bought your home. You bought some sort of historic architecture at a fraction of a price that other art would be well the weird the weird thing is it's the roof of this robert adam house which was built for george the third's doctor and it's it's actually grade one listed and they're only about i think they're six or seven thousand grade one buildings in the uk and of those two thousand are churches another thousand are things like the royal opera house and buckingham palace and nelson's column and things you can't really live in okay and so there are only about two or 3,000 grade one houses in the UK where you could live, which makes it pretty scarce. But I asked my next door neighbour, because it's the house is obviously split into apartments. I asked my next door neighbour, who's an economist, I said, what I don't get about this is we don't seem to pay any premium to live in a really interesting architectural house versus houses nearby that are basically the same size. And he said, no, I wondered about that once. And he said, it's somewhere between, if we pay a premium, it's somewhere between 0 and 2%. And I had a conversation with Shlomo Bernatzi about this. And we both agreed that actually architecture is the cheapest art you can buy. Because everybody obsesses about the location and the floor area and what the kitchen's like and what the maintenance costs are like. And actually, architectural quality so you can buy, you know, in the States, there's a wonderful website called Right on the Market, which is Frank Lloyd Wright homes that are for sale at any one time. And again, there's not much of a premium. Now, you know, OK, a great artist's painting can be, you know, 100,000, 10 million times the value of an indifferent artist's painting. But the same premium, the same value add doesn't seem to apply to architecture at all. And I, I did wonder if it did, because nearby in Tunbridge, there was this, Walter Gropius uh, house for sale 
And I thought, OK, well, you know, one of the greatest architects of the 20th century, uh, there's bound to be. And it was quite expensive. And then I realised the only reason it was expensive, it came with 70 acres of land and someone was probably planning to build on it, to be absolutely honest. I don't think any of the value was in the gropiousness of it at all. Um, it, it's kind of weird. That's all I can say. You know, that um, even super rich people don't compete at all. Um, there are few super rich people who get an architect to build their house. You know, that might happen in Silicon Valley. But it's it's a completely weird kind of anomaly. And it's similar, actually. If you go on YouTube and you look for Mark Carney and Damien Hurst. OK, now there's only one conversation, I think it's safe to say, between Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, and Damien Hurst. And Damien Hurst asked a very similar question. He says, what I don't understand about it, he said, is that when you produce a painting, everybody knows that the raw materials for the painting are a couple of hundred quid. You know, it's a bit of canvas, a bit of paint, a bit of wood. OK, but they'll pay anything for a painting, a million, you know, 20 million, 200 million. He said, what's weird is that when you produce a diamond skull, a platinum skull cr encrusted with diamonds, immediately everybody starts saying, well, what do the diamonds cost and how much are the diamonds worth and how much do you pay for the platinum? And there's something really odd, which is that there's a certain point at which the intangible value, which obviously with, with pictorial art, maybe as Hearst acknowledges with some sculptures, you know, Henry Moore sculptures, I mean, you know, you know how much did you pay for the marble, Henry? You know, whatever, um, or the bronze. OK, but there's a weird point at which the premium added by the ar architect or the artist in the case, in this case, goes from enormous to almost zero. And Shlomo Bonazzi said he, he said that given the extent to which good design and good architecture can contribute towards general happiness, it's completely weird how little effect this has. Have you came to Iraq? Really? Uh, no more than, I mean, Mark Carney was pretty stumped and so was Damien Hurst. So I'm not sure I'll be able to add to the debate. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the only, the only thing you could argue is that if there were a numerical, um, uh, value. Okay. okay so a really rich guy who gets a yacht built really, really cares about the quality of the design of the yacht. You know, I mean, before he died, Steve Jobs was getting intimately involved with every detail of this bloody super yacht. OK, but no one's ever seen Steve Jobs' house, right? <laughs> and don't, don't, ask me what, don't ask me why this is. It just strikes me as really sad, if you're an architect, that your, um, your work commands so little premium in the marketplace. Because, you know, personally, if I move to the States, you know, how much extra will I pay to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house than a, you know, a crappy house of the same size? Well, OK, I'd have to account for the fact that the maintenance might be a bit higher on the Frank Lloyd Wright house. I'd also have to account for the fact that they probably wouldn't let me bang on a conservatory, you know, right? You know, there are some constraints on what you can do to the house if you're in a grade one house. I grant the fact that that has downward pressure a bit. But nonetheless, I'd pay a lot more to live in a Frank Lloyd Wright house than a random bloody American house. And yet there doesn't seem to be a distinction in the marketplace at all. Maybe there are a few signature buildings in L.A., in LA. Uh, you know, uh, you know, some of those really remarkable buildings in Los Angeles. They might command a premium. Um, but in, you know, I, I don't know of it happening in New York, particularly. I mean, the only other guy I know who, who obviously has spotted this, Jimmy Page, um, lives in a very interesting house in London. Um, and I'll try and find let me let me find out what it is. Um, because uh, he's a next door neighbour with um, Robbie Williams, I think, and he keeps stopping Robbie Williams doing stupid things in his cellar. <laughs> um, and here we are. So the founder, here we are. The founder of Led Zeppelin lives in Tower House, which is a kind of Victorian castle in London. And uh, go and have a look at the Guardian article because the house is absolutely magnificent. Um, and he was always fascinated by it as a kid. Uh, no, sorry, he wasn't somebody because uh, he was a brummy, wasn't he, Jimmy Page? Um, uh, here we go. So, um, the tower house, it's called, it's got two front doors. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, yeah, it was designed by William Burgess between 1875 and 1881 in 13th century French Gothic style. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the interiors are absolutely extraordinary. I mean, just miraculous. So Jimmy Page seems to have spotted this weird anomaly, uh, but nobody else seems to care. That's super interesting. And on the flip to that, are properties in which celebrities and famous individuals live in, does that drive price up, opposed to the prolific nature of the art? Yeah, I think I think it probably does. <clears throat> I think it does in Hollywood, I know that much, a bit, because there's a certain bragging value to say that Douglas Fairbanks or whatever used to live in your house. Although there are cases where the house where some major Hollywood star lived is just demolished and replaced with something bigger. Um but I know, I know that I, th- I think, it, I think uh, you know, the celebrity owner does count a bit, and also I suppose gives you permission to think, well, you know, this is obviously a pretty good area and a pretty good house because if it's where they chose to live, it can't be that dumb a place for you to choose choose to live. Uh, you know, it does give a kind of what you might call permission. Yeah, it's strange how like the network. I just got another, the- another picture of Jimmy Page's house. <laughs> Jimmy Page's house is fantastic, by the way. Yeah. That's some absolutely cracking. All credit to the man. Yeah, mm. it's strange how you, how the networks that underpin these things can drive its value. Like, I'm, like I'm reminded of, is it Rembrandt? The is it the the, the What's the painting called? The Man with the Golden Helmet. I think it was testified that it was Rembrandt that painted it. And it was in significant value, but as soon as it was found out that it was one of his disciples, the value of the painting plummeted, even though the painting remained the same. It was the network and the artist that underpinned it that changed. Yeah, no, no. I mean, there there are a few famous cases. I mean, funnily enough, that painting that hit the record, which was the Leonardo, uh, there are a few art historians who dispute it. Um, And, um, you know, it's one of those utterly bizarre things that... um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I, there, there was a very good series on. I, I think it was probably Channel Four. It might have been Sky. It might have been Sky Arts, uh, with a couple of people going around uh, trying to authenticate paintings. Um, and it is extraordinary because in the case of Monet, for example, even though the evidence that this thing was a Monet was pretty um, uh, uh, was pretty indisputable, I would have thought from what I saw from the TV program. Um, there is some sort of weird Monet family authentication thing. You know, it's a kind of weird Freemasonic thing which authenticates Monets. And they persisted in saying no. And as a result, you know, that knocks kind of a million off the value. Just this sim- simple signature. And they're, they're lovely stories of this, of course, with, with Picasso. Uh, he went to one of the French uh, furniture makers and uh, uh, with, a, with a very rough sketch uh, for for the design of a wardrobe he wanted built. And um, he then said, well, how much would you want for this wardrobe? And they pointed at the sketch and said, just sign it. <laughs> um, which was, uh, uh, you know, as soon as he put Pablo on his sketch for the wardrobe, he'd paid for the wardrobe, basically. And so, you yeah, you get these complete anomalies where, okay, it makes it makes total sense with things like celebrity artifacts, doesn't it? Because you can say, well, if this wasn't Elvis's shirt, you know, I'm not really, you know, I'm just, what I'm doing is just, I'm not going to pay $25,000 for a fucking old shirt, right? Okay. Um, that, you know, because you'd feel really, really dumb. But equally with a painting, you, you have a totally fair point, which is, um, uh, you know, the, ex- I mean, that that's true. Of course, all the old masters had school of, and they also had their whole studio because you know the whole thing was to some extent a little bit of a factory. And so the extent to which it's exclusively the work of the master or not, um, you're absolutely right. I mean, a huge huge valuation hangs on it, but it's the same painting, you know. And um, I mean that if you ever want to watch a book, uh, there's a film on Netflix called Sour Grapes about this really weird. Malaysian figure who basically faked Romani Conti Burgundy wine. And he faked the labels, but he also faked the drink. And nobody seemed to, uh, he was just very clever at mixing together different wines to create something that basically, you know, tasted identical. And, and by faking the labels, he effectively created a totally fake kind of $5,000, $10,000 wine. And um, uh, the argument you had to make is, well, you know, if nobody cared, was he really cheating? 
Because if they all drank the wine, thought it was excellent, okay, and they had as enjoyable an evening as they would have done drinking the actual original, you know, we should have given the guy a medal rather than putting him in jail, I would have thought. There we go. <laughs> Rory, I think our last... Our initial conversation there was almost like a strip tease to the listener of what behavioural psychology is. For the listener's sake, how would you describe behavioural psychology in plain English? Well, I, I, mean, I suppose, I think, it probably rests on two things. I mean, OK, if we go back to the absolute first foundations, it sits on evolutionary psychology, which is we've evolved the brains we have, not necessarily optimally for the modern environment, but we've evolved our brains are the product of evolution just as much as the rest of our bodies. And I suppose you could take that a next step and say, as a result, our perception is not optimized towards accuracy, it's optimized towards whatever evolution deemed best for survival and fitness. And so, um, my argument is very simple, which is when we design furniture or door handles or kettles, okay, we design them for the hands we've got. And we didn't evolve hands to hold kettles or to um, steer cars with steering wheels or to open doors with door handles, because for most of human evolution, none of those things existed. So we design, we design the things to fit the physical equipment that we've already got. And so in your house, the door handle is probably a reasonable height, for example. It's not nine feet off the floor and it's not close to the ground. Okay. And my argument is that we have to, whether we like it or not, we have to design the world for the perceptual mechanisms we have and for the emotional responses we have, not for what is theoretically optimal uh, for some completely different species, which has, you know, perfect, uh, uh, perfectly objective perception. And so I mean, there, there, there are more and more people basically from a variety of places, neuroscience, um, evolutionary psychology, uh, certainly um, from um, uh, from behavioral economics, from behavioral psychology, more and more of them are effectively pitching into this point of view. There's a wonderful book by a guy called um, Don Hoffman called The Case Against Reality. And he argues that our perception of the world is really a kind of simulation that um, since if ever in evolutionary terms, if ever there's a trade-off between accuracy and fitness, fitness will always win. And so our perception will always trade off accuracy if it gives us an extra edge in evolutionary fitness, whether it's reproductive or survival, natural selection, sexual selection, whatever it may be. And by the way, our brains are probably modular as well. In other words, you know, I don't I don't mean literally that different parts of the brain are exclusively dedicated to performing certain functions, but our brains have probably evolved in a shape uh, with a modular architecture, uh, you know. Um, and my argument is that in making any decision in business or in public policy, um, you have to be cognizant of this, because if you don't understand essentially the, the, the beautiful, there's a wonderful book which has just been written and actually it hasn't been published yet in the UK. It comes out in September. And it's called, um, I think it's called um, Brands Mean Business. Um, and let me, and uh, it's uh, by a guy called uh, Matt Johnson, uh, who's a neuroscientist. And he makes a wonderful point where he talks about the difference between a product and a brand. And it's the difference between a house and a home. OK, that house is a thing. It's just a house. And, you know, it could be someone else's house, it could be anybody's house. But when you say home on top of the word now, home does mean house, presumably, unless you live in a caravan or a houseboat or whatever. But it also has a whole variety of meanings that the word house does not convey. And the simple thing, the simple thing we have to understand is that when we design products or when we design for behavioral change or we design an interface or we design a pension plan or whatever it may be, or a, you know, uh, you know, a government incentive scheme. OK, people don't care what things are because they don't judge what they are. They judge what they mean and what they mean depends on how they're presented, how they're named, how they're described, what color they are. 
It described it, it depends on a whole host of contextual factors and a whole host of associations, which are not integral to the thing itself. Um, and the example I always give, I'm sorry, people who've listened to my podcast before, I always give the example of a psychological solution being the Uber map, which is, no, it doesn't make the cab turn up any faster, but we're not so bothered about wait time in seconds. What we can't stand as humans is uncertainty. We can't stand that weird kind of hinterland period of kind of purgatory between the guy on the phone saying, yeah, your cab's on its way, should be about 25 minutes, and the cab actually turning up. You know, we just find that level of uncertainty of not knowing painful, whether it's eight minutes or whether it's 25, and the Uber map solves for psychology, it doesn't solve for reality. And it's a very, very interesting example of um, technology, really. I think that 10x improvements in psychology and perception are now a lot easier than 10x improvements in objective reality. You know, I, I don't think, I think it's a lot easier to make a plane journey 10 times more enjoyable than it is to make a plane go 10 times faster. And so I think I think there's something really interesting going on there. I, I've loved those insights, and I'm playing post-it note rain from the observations and revelations that I've had from reading your book. And I kind of want to kind of backtrack to when you spoke about kind of product design and how we have developed products to suit the kind of features that we've been given through evolution. And one of the things that stood out for me is like the concept of how we typically design for the average. Why why do we design for the average, and why isn't that inclusive? I don't think it's innovative designing for the average, one of which is actually that the average person may not really exist or certainly may not be very numerous. That The number of people who are actually average on multiple dimensions, if you measure, for example, bodily size, is amazingly small. Um, there are all kinds of reasons. I mean, one of which is that the average may be overserved already. Um, if you design for the average it probably isn't going to be all that innovative. And I think it's much more interesting if you look at new product development. Designing for an exceptional group, which may be, by the way, that I make a case in the book for designing specifically for the disabled. Okay. And then letting the benefits effectively. We had some great success. I think it might have been a parking app or something. Now, the interesting thing with a parking app is that there's a thing in, in app design called fat finger design, and you make all the buttons really big, okay? Now, if someone's 80 year old, years old, if someone has poor eyesight, if they have poor hand-eye coordination, all of those problems, okay, fat finger design is kind of necessary. Because quite a lot, I mean, one of the things that worries me, even as a 56-year-old who's quite technologically adapt, adept, okay, is that most things are designed by 27 year olds on a sort of 55 inch flaming, you know, 4K monitor or, or um, right? Okay. And these people have perfect eyesight. They're sitting in perfect environment and they go, yes, that looks great. And they're very, very distant from the actual circumstances in which these things are often used. In the case of a parking app, let's take a rail, what, what how do we actually use a parking app? Well, the likelihood is you don't stand around by your car and park. You use the app to pay to park while you're walking from your car to the shop, railway station or whatever else. So you're on the move. OK. Now, someone on the move using an app is actually very similar to someone who's stationary with, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis or Parkinson's disease using an app. OK. And so generally, when you design for people with spe with special needs or special circumstances, you do a better job of designing for everybody, because most people aren't using your product under perfect conditions, under laboratory conditions. I would make the point, you know, OK, at airports, you have lots of ramps for wheelchairs. Well, actually, the principal beneficiaries of these ramps aren't really people in wheelchairs. It's people with wheelie luggage, you know. And, and it and I've heard you use the example of door handles over doorknobs. Uh, do door handles are very interesting because I think it's mandatory now um, in new buildings to have door handles, not doorknobs. And the reason is that people with certain forms of arthritis, people who've lost uh, full use of their hands, can't use doorknobs very well. And there's a huge risk uh, that they get uh, you know, trapped in a building, you know, in, in the case of a fire or something. 
That's why you have, obviously, the extreme case is the fire door where you can just push your body against a bar and the door opens. You don't need to fiddle for a mechanism at all. The very act of people pressing against this door will cause it to open. OK, that's an extreme. This is, by the way, a lot of this comes from Don Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, affordances, which is a lovely, um, uh, a really lovely concept, by the way, which is worth worth reading and worth understanding. But interestingly, OK, if you've got wet hands, doorknobs aren't very good. You can't often can't open them. OK, or well, if you had unlikely but possible butter on your hands or you were very sweaty, a doorknob might be dysfunctional. But let's also consider that someone carrying two mugs of tea has effectively lost the use of both hands. Now, the great thing with a door handle is you can use an elbow. You can use a stump. You could at the absolute pinch use a foot or a leg. OK. And actually, the design for people with constraints is just generally a better form of design. You know, broadly speaking, you know, if you design text for people who have bad eyesight, it's not as if people with good eyesight really suffer. They probably find it easier to read as well. I mean, someone did a favour. I don't know if you're grateful for that, but whoever it was decided that shampoo opens at the top of the bottle and conditioner opens at the bottom, right? Because, OK, at one extreme, that's very useful for blind people because they can work out which is the shampoo and which is the conditioner. But it's worth noting that in a shower, which is very steamy, anybody who needs to wear spectacles or contact lenses is probably de facto 50% blind anyway. Particularly as the fucking designer has put shampoo in like six point flaming letters on the packaging. You know, my perfect brand of shampoo would just go shampoo. OK, but, um, I, you know, so, so I, I, I think I think it's just really interesting that, uh, to be honest, all this comes down. All this comes down to a very, very important distinction, which is the world as experienced, as seen, as perceived, as interpreted. Um, by everyday humans, okay, is an act of translation away from the world as it's designed by people higher up. You know, ultimately, I think you, I would like to see marketing as being a demotic popularist movement. And actually, funnily enough, a very interesting colleague of mine suggested exactly this uh, one of our board away days for an advertising agency, which is we should actually just cut out all this crap and say, Actually, yep, you're paying us, Mr. Client, Mr. Nestle, Mr. Unilever, but actually we work for the consumer. We work for the customer. You know, our only concern is how can we help customers get as much value from your product as they possibly can? And that might mean the removal of annoyances. It might mean the addition of, you know, interesting moving maps. But in other words, you know, essentially the marketing function is there to actually fight for the customer viewpoint. And to make the point repeatedly and in more or less every single circumstance involving customers that the way consumers experience things is not necessarily congruent with the way you intended them to be experienced. I'll give you a lovely example of this. I, 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 you know, quite a lot of marketing is finding unmet needs, but I also try to talk quite a lot about where services create met unneeds, where they do things which are supposedly in your interest, but are actually totally annoying. And the example I always give of a meta need is when you pitch up at a hotel and before you've even checked in, before you've got your room key, before you know what your room number is, someone tries to take your luggage. <laughs> so let, let me take that for you. Go, fuck off, no! I don't, you know, I've, I've just spent the last eight hours travelling here going, don't forget your suitcase, don't lose your laptop, whatever you do, don't lose your mobile phone, don't lose your laptop. And then this weird guy at the door of a building I've never been to before, before I even know which room I'm in, is trying to take my laptop away. And I know they, it's intended as a flaming service, but actually it scares the shit out of me. You know, are they searching for a tip? Is it actually mandated in the hotel's policy? The only thing a hotel should say there is, we can help you with your luggage if you wish. That's all. But instead, they go, let me... No, 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 don't leave that fucking thing alone. You know, it's, you know... And, 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 and so it's perfectly possible, by the way, in many, many cases, for businesses to optimise things that consumers don't really care about. In, in in many cases, I think in transport, I've written this book with Pete Dyson called Transport for Humans. Um, people effectively have over-obsessed speed and time-saving. 
as metrics in terms of designing transport versus other things like predictability of arrival time. You know, a lot of the time, people, to be honest, the reason people don't drive into London, uh, if you want me to be frank about it, is not because it takes longer than going by train. It's because you have no idea how long it might take. Mm -hmm. And so if you have any kind of deadline, you can't afford to take the risk. That's why you go in by train or take the tube. It's for dependability, not necessarily for speed. Rory, I was reflecting on your um, comment, and it was so damn hilarious around the concierge service. And it kind of reminds me of almost like virtue signaling. Um, another example that I absolutely despise, and I did a, a Room 101 style podcast with my mates over at Christmas. It was really fun. One of my Room 101 items uh, that I j jotted down but didn't have the time to discuss was when waiters or waitresses ask you how your food is whilst you're chewing food, they want to be seen as doing good and being helpful, but they're not. They're actually providing me an inconvenience, which is to be publicly ashamed for talking with my mouth open. It's really interesting because the number of times I've responded with like a thumbs up because I'm mid, mid chew. Now, funny enough, most people seem to find now it may be that there's a tip cor correlation in there that you're establishing yourself as their waiter. And you could argue, you could argue that it, it, it may be good in that it gives the table an opportunity to complain before it's too late. So there may be an argument that if someone says, well, actually, this steak is flaming cold or it's, it's underdone, that, OK, let me let me go and get you a replacement or let me go and bang that in the microwave, more likely. OK, but it gives you an opportunity to effectively uh, remedy a situation before it's too late. Because not everybody complains. And so there is some I can see some value to it. But the way it's done tends to be really annoying. Um, and it's um, uh, uh, why it can't be combined with. You see, now, if you combined it with, um, I was just wondering, one, whether your food was OK and whether you'd like any more drinks. OK, if it were asked with a supplementary question, first of all, can I get you any more drinks? And secondly, is your food OK? Uh, but, you know, I'd like to you know see if anybody you know needs topping up. OK, that would be... Um, uh, that would be quite clever. Um, but I think the way it's done on its own doesn't quite work. It, it's a bit like it's a bit like that McDonald's, do you want fries with that? And someone actually had a T-shirt pump printed once, which you could buy, which said, if I wanted fries, I would have fucking... <laughs> Okay, which was to which was to be worn into McDonald's when McDonald's became too famous for saying, "Do you want fries with that? Do you want to go large? Do you want to supersize this?" And so it's um, it is interesting. Now, it, what what interests me about that, by the way, is I'm a big fan of these fast food restaurant screen terminals where you can order. Because I find it one of the most interesting things was that. People used to cook. One of the most interesting discoveries of fast food restaurants was people cocked up their orders and were most stressed and clueless when there was a queue. Now, you'd think when there was a queue, people had had longer to decide what they wanted and longer to practice their order. But what it seems to be is the people behind you in the queue create social anxiety and they make you feel kind of rushed. And so it means you're more likely to basically muff up your order. Okay. Um, in circumstances when there are people waiting behind you. It's a very interesting discovery that a large part of the stress of going through airport security is created by the people behind you. If you've ever gone through airport security, happens to be quite a bit at Ebb's Fleet, where I joined the Eurostar, which is not super busy, okay, where you're the only person going through airport security. Totally stress-free experience. It's the bastards behind you who you think are judging you. Okay? A wanker's forgotten to take his belt off, okay? That's what makes it stressy. But the interesting thing with those screens is you don't have anybody behind you, so you're free to kind of add things, subtract things, edit your menu, decide what you want. But also they can cross-sell you things like do you want, you know, add fries for 75 pence, okay, in a way that's completely non-weird. Whereas if you do it in a conversation, you could probably try and upsell the, the, the customer in one or two uh, occasions, you know, uh, is there anything to drink and would you like fries with that? But anything more than that's getting seriously weird. 
And so, so those screens really interest me because they massively increase my propensity to use fast food restaurants, actually, because I don't find the business of ordering, particularly during KFC, where the choice architecture in KFC is quite complex, isn't it? I think I find that so fascinating, and the revelation that I've came to as well. I can imagine that these touch screens have increased sales because I can imagine you have some sort of preferential attachment to what the person in front of you orders. I, as a person, wouldn't want to order meals that are greater than those, um, and I would be ashamed if I ordered eight cheeseburgers maybe i was feeding a house party and i was taking them home i would be ashamed to buy eight cheeseburgers if the person behind me was going to listen to that but if i can interact with the screen and no one else knows what i'm ordering i think i'd have a greater propensity to buy more probably the big difference between online pornography and magazine pornography uh in the sense is if you see what i mean right Okay, so the great obstacle to paper pornography was you had to go into a shop and buy it. <laughs> and um, uh, the but but the interesting, I'll tell you a lovely story about that. That's a very very fair point, which is we are we're social animals. Okay, that's a very large part of this evolutionary psychology is we're primates. You know, we're human primates, but we're still kind of members of the chimpanzee, gorilla, bonobo kind of family, and. We, we, we always care what other people are thinking of us to some degree. Um, and you're absolutely right about that. So if, the pers- if you thought the person behind you or the person in front of you was just ordering from the bargain menu and you went in, went large, uh, you'd actually feel bad. You'd feel kind of awkward about it. It was very interesting. And of course, yeah, your total bill is private when you use a screen. Um, Really, really interesting, which is how pub orders would be different if you actually had a screen system. It'd be really interesting to look at what people ordered on pub apps during the coronavirus thing versus what they order at the bar. That might be a that might be an absolutely fascinating exercise. Because one of the, one of the, one of the weird things one of the weird things about the round system, okay, is there are certain drinks, okay. Okay, so Coke, Diet Coke, red wine, white wine, beer, lager, okay, don't require explanation because they're just in the default set of bar drinks, aren't they? You know, if you say, I want a glass of red wine, I want, you know, two pints of beer, that's totally not. Now, the second you say anything like cider or Dr. Pepper, you're in the realms of having to explain yourself. You've stuck your head above the parapet, you know. People go, bleh, bleh. okay, you, you now feel, you, you, nobody ever says, I'll have a beer because it's a hot day and I'm feeling thirsty. But they probably would do that if they ordered cider. They'd actually feel that cider required some sort of, you know, case, for, you know, exhibit A for the defence. It is a very hot day. And I, 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 always, I always say the magical property with Coke is extraordinary drink in that anywhere in the world you can ask for it and if they haven't got it they're idiots okay not your fault you're entitled to go and ask for a coke at any place that sells liquid beverages right you can go to france to a michelin star restaurant they bring you a coke they might go a bit you know but they still bring you the goddamn coke right okay now you can't say that about dr pepper can you you know yeah you know, beach shack in jamaica you know you could be in kind of you know, you could be in Mali in some weird, you know, village miles from anywhere. You could still get hold of the Coke and it would be a normal thing to ask for. How weird is that? You know, would that be right in How much saying does it cost to achieve that? Would that be right in saying they supplied Coca-Cola to rural villages in Africa before they were able to provide fresh drinking water? I think there was some weird thing. Certainly it's true that um, that some drugs companies have used Coke cases to get kind of rehydration salts and other medicines into remote villages in Africa because they noticed that wherever they went, there were always supplies of Coca-Cola because informal networks, I imagine, you know, the profit margins are nice enough for the distribution of Coca-Cola that basically in any village, it will pay somebody to go and get the stuff. And so, yeah, it it probably is this magical distribution system where more than anything else, it penetrates absolutely everywhere. Kind of weird, isn't it? Yeah. You, you mentioned how you would have loved to have seen the variation of drinks orders during COVID if we initiated 
um, touchscreen uh, facilities within pubs. One thing that I wanted to actually yeah, ask so you on. How, how, how do people drink differently? Yeah, how do people drink differently when they don't have to go and ask for it in a public place? Really, really interesting question. Have you in been on a Wetherspoons recently? Beers do really? better? Yeah, the app, the Wetherspoons app is really interesting. How do orders on the app differ from orders at the bar? Fascinating I, I, question. There, there's something that I absolutely love. So one of the questions I actually had for you was during COVID, when everything was shut down, there was such a great opportunity for behavioural reset. And there's a few things that I would have changed if I was the the head design, the <laughs> analogous head designer of all human behaviour. There, there's two things I want to... I, I would have made at, at the table, at, at the table serving should be mandatory in pubs. They can charge a premium for it if they want. But the, 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 the round system, I think, arose out of necessity during wartime. And the whole business of ordering at the bar, I think, I mean, even in the 60s, there were pubs in Liverpool where in the saloon bar, they brought you drinks to the table. And I think the business when people have little time to socialise, that one person is absent about 30% of the time fetching drinks in a crowded pub, you know, is really, really annoying compared to let's order some drinks now because we'll have finished our current drinks in 10 minutes. And if we're all sitting down having a chat, we don't really care if the drinks take 10 minutes to arrive. Um, that would be, you know, that uh, now, interestingly, I met Heineken's chief barman. And I said, you know, expecting him because he'd run loads and loads of pubs. He was Scottish, actually, uh, because he'd run loads of pubs. I expected him to go, no, 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 it's British tradition, round system. You get up, you go to the bar to order drinks. And I said, do you think it's basically time in the UK where we adopt the German system where you can actually order drinks brought to your table? expecting him to, as I said, go, absolutely not, round system. And he said, I've been saying this for years, he said. So I'm not alone in this, but I, I think it's just ridiculous. I think if you want to sit at a table and have a romantic evening without having to disappear off, you know, or if you want to have, you know, a catch up with friends for an hour without having to be absent and worry about the whole round thing and, you know, whose turn it is, it also probably leads to over drinking. Because with the round system, everybody ends up drinking at the pace of the heaviest drinker. Whereas conceivably with an app, you could easily design it so there's some sort of parity. You know, in other words, we've all had 12 drinks. The people who've had five can pay a bit more than the people who've had three. You know, and that kind of thing would strike me as, you know, intelligent use of technology. Uh, uh, another... Tell me yours. Uh, well, what things you want to mandate. Yeah, well, go on. Uh, it's, it's in a very similar vein, Rory. It's... The act of paying for your food or drink at the end of your service. I, I, I think that f time and time again is an inconvenience and a detriment to my customer experience because I have eaten or drank the thing and I no longer have any of it left and it was a delight and now I need to pay for it. Or I have eaten three courses and I'm knackered and I just want home but I then need to pay for something I've no longer got. I think paying it up front and then enjoying it would be a better psychological um, experience. Well, now, now Wagamama, interestingly, did some research which showed that the one annoying thing people didn't like about Wagamama was having to wait to pay. And so they did, for a time, develop an app where you basically gave your number to the waiter, okay? Your order appeared on the app. Uh, you could order things through the app if you wanted additional things like green tea, and which is free, uh, Wagamama. Uh, you know, and you wanted, you know, ice cream or something, you could, you could use the app to order. But at the end of it, you could just basically swipe, add a tip, pay, go. Okay, walk out, like McDonald's. The other interesting one there is Nando's. And I wonder if part of the appeal of Nando's to young people, it's not exclusively pay in advance, is it? But your main order you place at the counter, if I'm right, then you sit down, is that right? 100%. Same, same with Willisburn's order. As a 56-year-old man. Well, the Weatherspoons, the Weatherspoons app, you know this thing that happens, of course, with kids, which is that when it's their birthday, they publish the fact on social media, they publish their table number at um, Weatherspoons, and then all their friends, including some from other countries or other ends of the country, will then order them booze. It's dangerous because if you've got a large social media following, you could end up with basic alcohol poisoning. It's also dangerous because mischievous people the cheapest thing on the Weatherspoons menu is a bowl of peas for 50p. I've been okay. subject to that, and really. Mischievous people just... You've been subject to the pea bombardment, have you? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, but I, I, I love, I, there's a wonderful phrase, which is the street finds its own uses for things. And I do love it when a technology which is intended for one purpose becomes adopted for a completely separate purpose. And the guy designing the Weatherspoons app obviously thought, well, we can assume they're at the bloody restaurant. You know, there's, I mean, who on earth would want to order something at a Weatherspoons when they're actually 90 miles away? And suddenly, of course, you need to be able to search for the Weatherspoons because... Probably, you know, I don't know what. My guess is that, I don't know, three, four, five percent of Weatherspoon sales on a Saturday night, you know, might be people from completely different parts of the country just ordering in a round of drink. I've done it to my daughters at university, you know, and they, they, they occasionally go, surprise me, you know, and so you wang in a jug of pims in February or something, you know, to confuse the hell out of them. But, um, uh, but no, it's it, um, but the, the the Nando's thing is also interesting because you've paid for most of your meal, haven't you, before you sit down, and then you pay separately for the extras you have on top. Now, what's very clever about that is it splits the bill into two, which probably means nobody actually works out what they've spent in total. I've always wondered if that's a if that's a behavioural hack. It's a bit like the fact that nobody would go to Starbucks if Starbucks invoiced you monthly. You know, if Starbucks just said, hey, free coffee, uh, brilliant, we'll invoice you at the end of the month. At the end of the month, you've got an invoice for 60 quid or something. You go, shitting hell, you know, I'm not doing this again. But, you know, actually, there's lots and lots of really clever psychology. The Starbucks stored value card is also a really, really interesting payment hack. Because, again, because you've got £20 in your Starbucks card, when you spend £10 at Starbucks, it doesn't feel like spending £10 because that money was already predestined to Starbucks anyway. You've just moved it, it, turned it into coffee a little bit sooner. And so I think I, I think there's something to explore there with Nando's. I think there's something to explore with Weatherspoons. Um, you know, do people order fundamentally differently? Um, I'll tell you a lovely story about your question about feeling awkward about uh, ordering too many burgers, for example. <laughs> okay. okay. So a friend of mine um, worked at a, an investment bank in London. And one of his colleagues, um, who I think was from Hong Kong originally, but was, should we say, quite a large man, okay, even by my standards, okay? And he admitted to his colleagues that on Friday, okay, he used to order this massive Chinese meal blowout to be delivered to his apartment. And he was so embarrassed by the quantity of food that he arrived, that he ordered that when the guy arrived, he used to take the bag from the guy with the moped and shout upstairs, guys, the food's arrived, <laughs> even though he lived on his own. <laughs> He felt so bad about how much he was he was he was eating that the only way he could cover himself was basically pretending there were like three other blokes upstairs. Oh, that's brilliant! <laughs> oh, I love that story. There's, there's, there's one. There's one other thing that I would have changed um, if I was the master of a behavioural reset, and that's and this is probably the most contrarian thing to leave. Not a not not ca not car free days because. Because I, I would support car-free days, just occasionally, once a month. Have a day, no road traffic. Okay, we can all go and walk, you know, live locally. You know, I, 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 you know only emergency vehicles and absolutely essential journeys only, you know. I'd, I'd support that as a, as a weird mandatory intervention. Not frequently, but I just think very occasionally. It, humans like variety. And the trouble is we're optimised. The world is optimised for an average, you know. You know, in other words, what's good on Monday is good on Tuesday, is good on Wednesday, is good on Thursday. I'm not even sure I don't support, you know, keep Sunday special a bit, actually. You know, I'm not sure it wouldn't be better. I mean, the only problem about not having supermarkets open on Sunday was that they were far too crowded on Saturday. That was the problem. OK, but, you know, there was something to be said for having a day when you couldn't go shopping and you couldn't, you know, too late, you know, work it out for yourself. Uh, but you can't. I want to hear what yours is. Uh, just, just a quick one on the, the car-free Sunday or the car-free day. Was is that from solely an environmental point of view, or way broader than that? Part partly environmental, but partly just the variety of it. That there was something really nice during lockdown, very occasionally, of just going for a walk with a complete absence of traffic. You know, you could walk down. Pretty, actually, there there was a brief time during lockdown, maybe the first month, first two weeks 
where we went for a walk and we're close to the M25. And you could actually have a picnic in the middle of the M25 if you wanted to. There was so little traffic. There might have been like one one goods vehicle delivering, you know, perhaps every sort of five to ten minutes, practically. Um, that was extraordinary. But it was different. That That's my point, which is that actually, as human beings, we appreciate things that are different, that are novel. Uh, we don't necessarily have an, an optimal setting, uh, which is... You know, uh, you know. Uh, Nassim Taleb makes the point very beautifully. He says the perfect temperature in a room is not seventy-two degrees Fahrenheit or you know, uh, twenty-one degrees centigrade. It's not that. No, it's a room that's slightly too hot, but with a random cool breeze that blows in every now and then. That's why it's so nice being able to open a window because you can have the room slightly hot room, but every now and then a little bit of cold air comes in, and you start enjoying the warmth and enjoying the cold. And that's more enjoyable than having a kind of air-conditioned room set at an absolutely constant uh, uh, level of temperature. So I, I'm desperate to hear what yours is. For yeah, just a quick sidetrack on that. I I don't know if I was influenced by your work on this, but I did recognise during lockdown that memories were stored for me on two factors: novelty and intensity. And the whole the whole reason I started my podcast during lockdown was because I could speak to someone like you every single week. And for me, that would cement each week as unique and different because I had a novel guest that I had to pre- prepare for and I had to evoke emotion towards, which was typically nerves. I had both novelty and intensity every week, which segmented my every single week during COVID when all of our usual novelties were strip, like strip, uh, stripped away from us. No, and actually, you're right that actually we thrive on. I mean, to be honest, most of us in okay, apart from the fear, and assuming no one near and dear to us was ill, and apart from the general air of menace, in some respects, parts of lockdown were probably enjoyable to most people, simply because it was different, and it was an excuse essentially to do different. Now, you know, I have to caveat that very heavily, which is there were people who were ill. There were people who had close friends, relatives, etc., who were ill. Um, um, and also, you know, no one derives any pleasure from anybody else's suffering, I hope, or not many people do. But nonetheless, um, it's a bit like uh, I go down to Deal quite a bit, which is on the East Kent coast. And I always say about Deal, the great thing about Deal is that the weather's either it's either sunny or it's shit. OK. And if it's shit and it's raining, you just go, that's fine. I'll just go in and watch television. If it's sunny, you go outdoors. And it doesn't really matter. We're, we're Brits, right? It doesn't really, it's a nice day if it's sunny. It doesn't matter what the temperature is, okay? If the sun's shining, it is a nice day. That isn't true in South Africa. I arrived in Johannesburg where I didn't realise the whole of the Johannesburg winter, you never get a cloud in the sky. And I came out of my hotel room to be met by the people from the Joburg Agency. And they said, um, beautiful sunny day. You know, not, as I said, blue sky all around i said i'm sorry you had to come during such terrible weather and i burst out laughing i thought, thought they were joking right and they said no, no no we're serious i said what do you mean it's terrible weather it's fucking sunny funny south african idiots what are you complaining about and they said well it's really cold well it was about three degrees I, I, I think there had been a frost overnight it was now you know a few degrees above freezing and they regarded that as terrible weather spoiled bastards i mean honestly but it was really fascinating to me because it, I, I just thought I just came out of the hotel thinking, hmm, what a lovely day. And um, it is, it is re- I mean, this stuff is really, really interesting because. Carry on. I, I'm still desperate to hear what your idea is for your mandatory behavioral change to be made permanent after lockdown. 